Welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson. Today we will be reconvening with Ian Rob Wright for part two of our interview. If you missed the first part, then just head on back to episode 89. Although that said, I think there are nuggets of wisdom and information on self-publishing that you can glean from both parts, so... You know, why not rock the boat, listen to episode 91, and then go back, listen to part one, episode 89. Before we get into the main content of the podcast, I just wanted to thank everyone who's listened to the podcast, because April has been our best month so far. We've had the most downloads, we've had a lot of people sharing the podcast on social media, And I've been inundated with messages from all of you, the listeners, whether email or whether via social media, just telling me how much you enjoy the podcast and what we're doing. Well, let me tell you how much we appreciate you, because without you, this wouldn't even be able to happen. So that is why today we have another fantastic interview for you I think you're going to love this. I think you're going to get a real lot out of it. One of the most successful writers within the horror sphere, self-publishing. None other than Ian Rob Wright. So this is it. Part two of our interview with Ian Rob Wright. And now for our horror interview. We've spoken a lot about the Kindle edition of your books, but what are you using in terms of printing your paperbacks? I've always used Create Space, um, which you know it has its pros and weaknesses. It's uh, it is a difficult platform to get right, um, especially when you're trying to get the covers perfect and the interiors. The last year or so, I've been using templates, which have made life a lot easier. I've um, I've, I've, I can't remember the website it's called now, but I found a template generator which you told it how many pages your book had and it would give you a grid to put your cover into with the spine and the front and the back. So that solved the problem of the covers, you know, not always being perfect when, when you got the proofs back. Um, and on Hugh Howie's website, you might have to have a look for it. He's got um, a guide on how to format in Adobe InDesign and I've been using that to format the interior of my books. Um, which has is, is led to them being sort of far more professional um, than they were when I was formatting them in Word and also using the template speeds things up a lot. Um, sales within Create Space, I mean, they're, they're, they're only a tiny percentage of what I make as an author, but I know some, some authors sort of make more money with their paperbacks and they focus on them more. I tend to do them just to, you know, to please those that do like to have paperbacks. I don't want to alienate any portion of my audience and there are still people that prefer to read paperbacks. So I've been, you know, missing out on on their support by not having a paperback. So I do them more to fulfil a need of a certain section of my fan base than because they're a massive financial um benefit to me i'd say i only earn sort of two three hundred dollars a month from from paperbacks which is Mm -hmm. you know insignificant compared to everything else including audio books which make a lot more um but you know paperbacks it's nice to have them as well and to give them out signed and i'm i'm probably looking at doing a bit more with them in the future um by sort of offering special editions and stuff but right now it's about focusing on the things that give you the biggest return and paperbacks are kind of they're a bit low down on the priorities for me to really do much with. Well, a lot of people both in self-publishing and in indie publishing seem to always go for either Create Space or Lightning Source. Yeah. I wonder, was Lightning Source ever a consideration? And if so, what was it that made you sway towards Create Space? I think in the early days, I threw everything came with Amazon because once they had me with KDP, you know, they were advertising other services to me. And I think the trust I have in Amazon as an author is similar to the trust people have in Amazon as shoppers, you know, you know, you're in good hands. So I went with Amazon because 
most of my business was through Amazon anyway, and I knew that by publishing my paperback through them, then they had a vested interest in my paperback selling. Um, so that's why I did that. But I do know that sort of people that use Lightning Source, the paperbacks are possibly slightly better quality, and you've got the option of hardbacks as well. Um, I think if if paperbacks were more substantial to my business, I probably would switch to Lightning Source to to do hardbacks and to improve the quality um, because I think it probably is a better service. It's a premium service and it costs more. Um, but because sort of paperbacks, you know, they're not a massive part of my business. I'm happy with the, the sort of the cheapest, easiest option, which is Create Space. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So you mentioned audiobooks as well. So how did you first get into those and what are you using? Um, I use ACX, um, which I got into because I was invited um, by Amazon to a, um, a meeting in London. Um, I took the horror author Matt Shaw as a guest with me, mm. uh, and he drank most of the wine that they provided and got really drunk. And then <laughs> told me on the way out that he never drinks. So I'm like, well, why did you drink all the wine? Because I was drinking water. And he goes, I don't know, it just seemed polite. So it was memorable, but I was there with um, the UK head of ACX at the time, uh, Lawrence Howell, um, and I chatted to him extensively. And and you know they had they they still do have big plans for the platform ACX, and uh, audiobooks are growing um, month on month. So it's it's a growth area. Um, and when they released ACX, which took any financial risk out of um, producing audiobooks, you know it was uh, there was absolutely no reason not to do it. Um, so I work primarily with a, a narrator called Nigel Patterson, who I'm really happy with. Um, he's done most of my books. And then there's several done by Chris Barnes as well, who's based in the UK. Um, and I make money for books I've already written. Um, so, you know, it's fantastic. And in, in the future, I might possibly pay up front to have them produced so that I get 100% of the royalties. Um, but at the moment, I do a 50-50 royalty share with the narrator which you know, I'm happy to do, and, and some books have been more successful than others, but you know, overall it's, you know, it's made several thousand pounds for me in the last couple of years, so it's, it's definitely something you should do because you've written the work, all you've got to do is upload it and choose a narrator. And it is great, it's great listening to sort of someone narrate your book, it gives it sort of new life, um, you know, and it's, again, it's, it's another section of your, your fan base that you can serve as well because there are people that want audiobooks, and it can be incremental as well because there's a lot of people who have brought my book on Kindle or paperback who also buy the audiobooks. It's not necessarily instead of. It can be incremental um, on top of a sale you've already made. So it's it's selling the same product in a different media. So it's win-win, really. Mm. And speaking about the cost, I mean, what would you say it costs you to self-publish a title generally and how quickly do you make that money back? Um, and if you could, if you could break down the different costs, that would be really useful. Well, if we go worst case scenario and pick one of my longer books, so The Gates, which was 100,000 words, editing a book of that size, you, you know, you're looking at around $1,000 at least. Um, it, it depends on who you're working with. You know, there are some editors out there who will absolutely you know, rip your book apart and give you pages and pages of notes who might charge you, you know, $2,000. And they're worth that money because they're providing you $2,000 worth of editing. When you've been doing it a while, such as myself, you don't necessarily need that amount. And with sort of 600 beta readers and pro writing aid and the things that I use, I, I just need an editor to catch my mistakes and point out, you know, where I've been you know, incorrect or, you know, if I've written something that's a bit nonsensical, I need someone that's going to spot that for me. So, you know, I, I pay around, you know, $1,000 for a 100,000 um, word book. Um, so that's the, that's the biggest cost. Cover artwork, I was using an American author who was charging me $450 a cover. Um, I'm also working with a guy called Stuart Back now who I wouldn't want to sort of quote the prices that he's given me because he might quote differently. But, um, you know, two, three hundred pound for a book cover is about what you should expect to pay for a decent quality. But, you know, if once you're established, you'll make that back, you know, in the first week, let alone the first month. When you launch a new title with a good cover, you haven't got to worry about those costs. They'll immediately be, 
you know, covered by the, the launch of the book. So it's it's never anything I worry about paying. I know it's it's part of why my books sell well, having a great cover. Um, I've just redesigned the, the, the cover for the Gates to be a bit more um, mainstream publishing, and I'm really pleased with it. So there's a good chance I'm going to have all the covers redone for my books because it really does make that much of a difference. Um, you mentioned earlier my book covers are really good. I could leave them like that and be happy, but I'm probably going to try and make them even better. Um, so when you, you are paying for artwork and editing, you shouldn't, you know, win, wince too much about it because the things that will pay for themselves in, in either selling the book right now or in pleasing the readers enough that they'll buy your next book. So if you haven't edited correctly, then you'll lose that reader at book one. And then if you've got ten books, you know, you've wasted nine sales there that a happy reader would have purchased. So I'd say worst case scenario, about $1,500 a book, uh, it costs me. Mm. And I suppose when you change the cover art as well for the really loyal fans that collect your work, they might even buy the book again to get that cover. Certainly with paperback, yeah. Um, I mean, with, with Kindle, it wouldn't let you repurchase the same book. And it stupidly, if... If I re-edit a book or change the cover, um, it doesn't update unless the reader requests for it to be updated to the latest version, which I've always found irritating. Because if I spot a mistake or say I re-release a special edition and add some some special content at the end, I want that to go to the people who've already previously bought the book. Um, but it doesn't, and that, that's uh, something I think Amazon should look at changing so that if an update for a book goes through, it should automatically update on people's Kindles. Um, but yeah, certainly with paperbacks, if you change the cover, it's it's, it's essentially a, a new edition, isn't it? So yeah, collectors, it's a, mm. it's a good thing for them. We have a question from Thomas Joyce from our Patreon. So going back to the yacht that we were speaking about earlier, uh, given your background with self-publishing, how did you find working with Infected Books and David Moody? I mean, I guess what were the key differences as well? I mean, they're, they're professional guys and, and also, you know, despite the success David's had and, you know, having films based on his work and stuff, he's, you know, he's very respectful, um, you know, and he didn't in any way treat me like, you know, he was better than me or I needed to listen to him. So it was very sort of hands off for them. They were happy for me to get the ball and run with it. I wrote the book. They they said they loved it. Um and then, you know, he made a few suggestions and um, they felt it was a bit um, heavier with the exposition at the beginning of the book. Um, so they wanted me to sort of move some of the backstory further into the book to keep the pacing going at the early stages. Um, and then they really just did a line edit on it to, to sort of check any mistakes. So, you know, it, it was nice. The book that I released was the book I wrote. It wasn't tampered with, you know, in any great fashion. And I, I feel that they really enjoyed the book themselves, so it was great, you know, that it was appreciated. It wasn't just like, you know, get this book to me now, I'm going to release it and then move on and forget about it. They were they were as happy to release it as I was to to sort of work with them. So it was a it was a good relationship all around. Um, and I, I've met David and Wayne Simmons, who works with him in person, and they're, they're lovely guys. So mm. I'm, I'm glad that I did it. And again, in the future, you know, I'll do the odd favour here and there where I can for you know, fledgling publishers, if I know the, the people running it, I might do something to help them. Um, but yeah, it, was, it, it only took, you know, a month of my time and I'm, I'm glad it's out there. It's a novella I'm happy with and I'm splitting the profits on it, but that that's fine because I know that, you know, David will help find a new audience through his publisher for me, so it'll benefit both of us in the long run. And having read it, it's quite a different take on the zombie mythos as well, not least because... It's ambiguous without giving too much away as to what has actually happened and what is actually happening within the story. So I quite like that it leaves the reader to come up with their own conclusions. But in terms of doing something original and a little bit different, was that a big concern coming into the story? I mean, it had to be a zombie novella because that was the theme of, of the release that they're doing. Um I think zombies are getting a bit tired anyway. Um, so, you know, I certainly didn't want to just release something that's been done before. And I had a similar mindset when I wrote the three zombie novellas. I did Seasick, um, Ravage and Savage. Seasick set on a cruise liner with a Groundhog Day twist. 
um, of the day repeating. Ravage is set in a theme park on the top of a hill, um, and Savage is set at a pier. So I tried to be different with sort of all my zombie novels in the past, and also, you know, I didn't want to be known as a as a zombie guy. Um, so whenever I, I face a genre like zombies or something that's that has a lot already written, yeah, I, I, I do think right, how can I make this different? Um, and I think with the yacht, I, I like I like horror films where there's a big ambiguous twist at the end. So I think I started with with the ending and worked backwards really. So yeah, I, def- I definitely wanted it to be a bit different um, and worthwhile. I didn't just want it to be just another zombie book. Mm. Do you find that uh, that you try to follow certain types of conventions with within the genre? In other words. Looking at your titles, I pretty much see horror, but I mean, do you try to focus on zombies? Do you focus on ghosts? Do you try to try something different, you know, every time? Is it just whatever hits you? Do you get on a trend? Um, I think it's whatever hits me. I mean, if we if we go quickly through some of my books, my first release, The Final Winter, was um, an apocalyptic horror novel set in a cosy atmosphere of a pub. My second book was Animal Kingdom, which is about the animals turning on mankind and attacking. My third book, Asbo, was about a gang of youth targeting a family, so no supernatural elements whatsoever. Um, Then I wrote The Housemates, which is, again, uh, no supernatural elements. It's um, a reality show mixed with Saw, where the the contestants are being tortured. So every book I write, you know, is very different, and I think I, I do that to keep myself interested. However, despite that, they are all linked into sort of um, overarching universes, and that's something that Brian Keane does a lot. And sort of before I was a writer, I was a massive Brian Keane fan, and I think that inspired me to make my books all different, like he does. So he's got zombie novels, but he's also got different novels that maybe aren't even supernatural. Um, he wrote a book called Terminal, which is one of my favourite books ever that's barely supernatural. But he ties them all together anyway, so they're kind of all part of the same series, yet they're all completely different, and that gives me the best of both world, worlds in that I'm producing into a series with common themes and common characters, but I'm completely different with the plot, so I'm not getting bored and my readers aren't getting bored. And it just allows me to spread my wings, and I've written a couple of straight thrillers as well. The Sarah Stone books are, are very much like 24, but with a female protagonist. Um, Wings of Sorrow was my first young adult novel, which is inspired by Buffy and Angel and books like that. I think generally, and again, self-publishing gives you this freedom, is I write what I want to write, and I, I tend to have the ideas of what I want to write based on what I want to watch or read as a as a horror fan first. Um, I've been a horror fan my entire life. I've been a writer for the last five years, so the, the horror fan part of me is, is a lot more well-developed than the horror writer part of me. Well, that makes sense, and you know, it's. I know that a lot of writers now they seem to kind of get into this niche. Like you know, the big thing is you know uh, weird fiction. But at the same time, you, you want it. You want to kind of ride on the coattails of things as much as you can, uh, just because it's going to help you be more successful, take advantage of a trend. But you also want to be kind of you know more of a well-rounded writer because you never know when a trend is going to end or end badly. Uh, <laughs> depending on on the market, so you know that's that's good. That's good that you've uh, you know you use what you've you know being a fan of horror and try to stay away from the niches and things like that and do what you, do what you want to do. That's yeah. to me that's probably really important for for any writer, whether you're established or starting out. It's to, 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 no matter what, do what you want to do. Yeah, and I found that there's a lot of. Um readers who email me and say, I've just read Ravage. I don't usually like zombie novels, but I really loved it. And the reason they checked it out was because they'd read a book of mine which wasn't, you know, a zombie novel. It was Sam, which is about a possessed young boy, or Asbo, which isn't even supernatural. And they enjoyed that book so much that they thought, well, you know, I'll take a risk on this zombie novel. Maybe it'll be different. You know, so by diversifying, I'm, I've got a wider net to collect people. And if you collect somebody with a thriller novel you know, they might check out your horror novel and vice versa, whereas if you're writing nothing but zombie novels, then you're only ever going to get zombie novel fans. If you're writing a lot of things, then you've got a much bigger net to catch people with. Exactly. Well, having written such a diverse amount of stories within horror, what is the hardest story you've ever written? 
Possibly Asbo, um, because it was partly autobiographical in sort of the based on the area I grew up. Um, and because it's sort of it's something that could happen and does happen today, you know, it's a it's a crime violence thriller. Um, and the horror comes from, you know, what's happening in the world in some places, you know, people being victimised by crime and, and sort of unnecessary violence from youths and things. And, you know, I was submerged in that, you know, up until the age of about 20 by the fact that I grew up in a bit of a rough area. And, you know, it, it was frightening because I was drawing more on experience than with, you know, the other books I've written. But I'm also finding the book I'm writing now, um, which is called Legion, and be out in a few weeks. It's the sequel to The Gates. It's the first book I've written that's that's a, um, a complete continuation of a previous book. Um, Ravage and Savage are part of the same series, but they, they kind of have their own plots, which share characters, but they don't continue necessarily directly on from each other. Whereas Legion will completely follow on from the events of The Gates, and it's it's been difficult to write a pure sequel because you don't know how much to retread. You're, you're banking on the fact that people have read the first book, so you leave certain information out because you're relying on the fact that they should, your readers should already know that. And I've never written a book where I'm intentionally leaving out information that people need to know, so it's, it feels very unnatural thinking, I should explain this situation here, but I've already done that in book one, so I'm just going to move on. It feels very much like I'm leaving holes in the story, which, if people have read book one and they remember it, isn't the case, but it's certainly it's out of my comfort zone writing a pure sequel. And a lot of authors have concentrated on series, and, and many successful authors say that series is where you get, you get your success. But this is the first time that I've actually sort of written a, a second horror book that completely follows on from book one so I found that difficult technically um, emotionally then yeah I'd say Asbo was the most difficult because because it was the, the closest to sort of the reality of life. Well I wonder with Legion and you don't see this done so much but as a kind of way around it would it be possible to put in the front of the book a kind of summary of the gates, so it's like previously on, as it would be with television series. You know, that's not a bad idea. You know, I might, I might just end up doing that based on your idea. So we'll see. Yeah. But <laughs> okay. That's a good idea, and I do think there's a there's a future in, especially with the quick churning of eBooks in self publishing, that books become a bit more like television series, and that people might release you know, episode one, episode two of shorter novels of a longer plot. Um, so I certainly think there's there's definitely some, uh, the, you know, people love binge watching television now. I think there's going to be uh, sort of an avenue for books to get a bit like that in the, you know, re- season one of this book, you know, with 12 episodes released, um, you know, once a month of 30,000 words instead of your standard sort of 70, 80,000. So... Um, previously on um, might might be something that ends up going into sort of series or right in the future so that people that do start on book two can know where they're at so yeah it's a good idea yeah I think we are starting to see a few more episodic stories and I think as well actually with the Patreon crowdfunding platform where people pay either for a piece of content or per month it's becoming a more viable way of doing things. And I've seen some authors that are actually using Patreon and releasing things chapter by chapter to write their novels as a viable alternative to the other options out there. Yeah, and I think Kindle Unlimited also lends itself well to sort of episodes because it's not then about um, charging a fee for, you know, a small part of a story. It's about releasing content quickly and you know regularly because people are paying the monthly fee and you know like they do with television networks and sky and things so they're just going to want content quickly rather than necessarily value for money when you release a novel you know people want to pay four pounds for a novel that's going to take them you know a week to read whereas they might not necessarily want to pay for a thirty thousand words episode one however with kindle unlimited that's not a concern because they've already paid what they're going to pay what they're more interested in is keeping the reading going and you can provide that by releasing short amounts quickly so it might definitely be the way things are going 
Yeah, well, I'm a subscriber to Kindle Unlimited, and I definitely think the amount of content out there, both fiction and non-fiction, makes it well worth subscribing every month. I mean, I've calculated that I easily read a lot more than I'm paying in terms of face value for the product. Yeah, it's it's definitely um, the way things are heading, and it's already gone that way for sort of music and television. So um, I like I like the current iteration that you get paid per page as an author. Um, I think that's fair, um, and it also rewards good writers that are writing things that are getting read to completion. Um, so I mean, it does worry me that Amazon decide how much they're going to pay authors retroactively rather than say you earn this much per page mm -hmm. they'll then look at it at the end of the month and go right we're going to pay this much and that works out at this i don't like amazon having that that power over the market so it does frighten me in some ways um mm -hmm. but at the moment you know it's working very well for me my readers enjoy it and it it compensates me fairly so um at the moment yeah if it stays as it is then i'll see you know, content coming out more quickly and cheaply for readers to enjoy. We have a bit of a different question now. So this is from Paula Limburg from our Patreon. Hi, Paula. She's a <laughs> mine, I believe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so how do you separate the writer of horror from the loving husband and father that you are? So I think that's what surprises people about me is that you wouldn't, no, there's anything off about me by meeting me. Um, <laughs> like there's, looking in my office right now, um, I've got two caricatures that we had done um, in Universal, one on our honeymoon, one um, a couple of years before that. I've got a sketch painting of me and my wife um, from a trip to Portugal. I've got photos. I've got um, a Donald Duck and a Daisy Duck on my windowsill. <laughs> so I haven't got horror posters all over my wall or, you know, horror toys on my desk. Um, you know, and there's nothing like that in my house. And, and it's sort of I don't dress like a like, you know, the crow or anything like that. I'm completely normal. I, I love horror, but that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, I, there's anything strange about me. Um, I am sort of a family man. You know, some men aren't, other men are. That's just who I am as a person and who I've always been. I, I've just always loved horror. And I, I think I loved horror because I had a, a tough time growing up. And I think people don't realise is that more than anything, horror is quite often about hope. It's about you know getting over adversity it's about fighting your demons and coming out stronger and I think horror gave me a lot of what I needed to get through my teenage years and it's close to my heart for that and as a writer I'm trying to provide that service to new readers I'm not you know I'm not a sicko trying to freak people out I'm trying to offer people a monster that they can you know prevail against through my work um, and I write from a very hope, um, hopeful, happy, you know, loving place in, in regards to my books, even though they're horrific. They're really about the characters surviving and the characters coming together to survive, you know, insurmountable odds. So personality wise, I'm not a very dark character. I'm, I'm quite, you know, open and friendly and happy. Um, and I surround myself with, you know, Disney and, and uh, caricatures on my wall and things. I don't surround myself by Pinhead and Leatherface, you know. I love to watch those films, um, but, you know, I don't, you know, they're not part of my outside life. Horror is, is something I enjoy, but it's not necessarily, um, you know, who I am as a person. I'm not a horror guy. I'm an author that enjoys horror. Paula has a second question, which is, what inspires you to reach out and offer help to those who are trying to get into the business of writing? I think it's paying it forward based on the fact that there were those that helped me, such as J.I. Conrath, um, who you know, helped me in a passive way at first by reading his blog and reading his book, and then in a more hands-on way by working directly with me. You know, I think one of the good things about self-publishing is that there's less, well, there's more transparency. We're all in it together. We're sharing our figures. We're sharing what works. And um, what we've found, you know, against what one would believe is by being open and sharing, we're actually all getting stronger. You know, self-publishers are getting better and earning more and 
you know, things are getting more disruptive for traditional publishers and we're doing the exact opposite to what they've always done. You know, their authors have always been very shady about what they're earning, about their contracts. They've been very closed with their fans, you know, their hands-off approach. And, and by doing the exact opposite, our publishers have been, you know, gaining ground and, and I want to support that. I don't want that to change because it's helped me, it's benefited me. So it's important for me to help other authors um, because, you know, and if you look at it from a selfish point, I've helped authors who shout about me helping them and promote my books happily and, you know, recommend me as an author and thank me in their books and things. And that puts my name in front of more people. So by helping, you know, an author this year, if he gets big in two years, my name gets put in front of his audience by virtue of the fact that he's going to say that he owes me. Um, so, you know, there's a business sense behind being helpful, but, you know, it makes me feel good. You know, I, I like to think I'm a nice person and helping people feels good. The only the difficulty is that, you know, a lot of authors would like you to help them one-on-one. -on -one. They send you their book and say, will you read this? And, you know, the answer is no. I, I just don't have the time, which is why I focus on my blog posts as a way of helping people en masse if I can. If I learn something that works, and I'll, I'll post about it and let people know. I can't help people one-on-one, -on -one, um, but I can certainly provide tools for people to help themselves. And if I, like pro writing aid, if I discover something that's brilliant, you know, I won't keep it to myself. And Matt Shaw was um, learning a lot off me as, as a horror writer for a couple of years he was always looking up to me and and trying to um get the level of success that i did and now you know he's surpassed me he earns more than me his books sell more than me and i haven't been able to get the number one spot back from him for the last couple of years and he did a lot of that based on the things i taught him but i don't resent him for that because i know that he also is very humble about the fact that i did help him um and that you know, it gives me something to aim for as well. Matt was one of my students in a way, and he's kicked my ass now. So now I want to get back, to, you know, and, and and knock him down a peg, and that's motivated <laughs> me. So by helping each other, we raise our game. You know, I helped Matt, and now he's beaten me, and now I want to beat him. So it's it's inadvertently helped myself because I now want to be better than I am to beat the person who I help be better. So I'm helping myself by helping others. And both Matt Shaw and J. A. Conrath are. Uh two authors that you've co-authored work with so how does that collaborative writing process differ from your usual method with joe it was very easy um i basically asked if i could write a sequel to his book um origin which i loved and he said yes um i wrote the entire book and then gave it to him he then changed a great deal of it to suit his purposes, so it ended up being about 50-50. So you could say that the first draft was mine, the second draft was his, and the third draft was ours together. So it kind of ended up being a sort of a mutation of our, our, our ideas together. Um, that was really easy because I just wrote a book as normal and sent it to Joe, and then he sent it back as an editor would with his changes and, and vice versa. I did try to write a full-length novel with Matt Shaw, and that was a nightmare for both of us because our styles are so different. Matt writes predominantly in first person. I've only ever written in third person limited. Um, trying to meld our two styles together um, just got tougher and tougher until we both just sort of called a, an end to it. I went on to release... The book myself with the the parts that I'd written as two three eight nine um, a space horror novel. It was originally intended to be a, um, a co-authored book between myself and Matt, um, but we gave up in it halfway. So I think it depends on on the authors. So we all have our different ways of working. Um, Matt and I work very differently, and technically we're very different as well. So it didn't work for us to do a full-length novel. So we've collaborated in other ways. By you know, Matt's got some of his short stories at the end of my novels. We've you know worked in box sets together and things like that. So it's it's difficult to collaborate, and I'm not sure you know if it's something I'll do again. Um, but yeah, we, I mean, with Joe, it was easy. Um, Matt, it was hard so you just you know your mileage may vary you have to try it out and see if it works for you yeah and I think experimentation is important and you know you and Matt tried to experiment on that and it didn't work out and not all experiments do but it sounds like you know you're both doing incredibly well at the moment so it's not really impacted you too badly all things considered no I think um, a good way 
to collaborate and what I'd like to do one day, um, I don't think my ego is quite there yet, is the Kindle Worlds type thing. I think possibly once I have some series set in place with, you know, strong universes, I might um, offer, you know, authors a royalty share if they want to write books based on my characters and worlds and then I'll just have a sort of a management view and over overall view of a book to just check it you know conforms to certain rules that I've put in place and um, but predominantly leave it to individual authors to write their books so certainly if I get more success and I've got more long established series which I'm working on currently then I may offer some sort of collaboration that way to help you know new authors get sales from benefiting from my brand. What do you think are some of the biggest misconceptions about self-publishing? I think a lot of them are true, to be honest. Um, I think there is a, a danger when buying a self-published book that it might be poorly edited um, or no good at all. You know, that, that is something that brings self-publishing down, but it's the nature of what it is. I think the biggest preconception is that um, legitimate, well, I say legitimate, traditional authors don't think any of us are making a living. Um, I know that recently at a conference, um, someone said that, you know, um, oh, self-publishers don't make a living. None of them can work full time. And um, who was it? Um, Adam Neville was there and he said, well, what about Ian Wright? And he actually used me as an example to say, you're talking bullshit, mate. <laughs> But there's a lot of people, um, establishment figures, who, who seem to think that it's not happening. They seem to think that self-published authors are only making pocket money, you know, and that there's a few exceptions like Hugh Howey and J.A. Conroff. But that's not the case. There are a lot of what you, I suppose you could consider mid-list authors now within self-publishing that are making a full-time living. They might not be millionaires. I'm not a millionaire, but I'm doing what I love. I'm working what hours I want, and I'm earning more money than I ever would have in any other avenue. That for me is success. I may not own a yacht um, or be lunching in, you know, New York with the big wigs of, you know, Random House, but I'm successful. I'm full time, and there's a lot of authors, many of which I know, that are doing that. And I think one of the big misconceptions is that it's as much a lottery in self-publishing as it is in traditional publishing, and, it, and it's just not. It's very much, and I say it again, it's very much like a business. You know, we all have the same chance in self-publishing and those who work hard and work smart will make a living. You know, it's there to, there's money there to be made, there's customers to be sold to and if you do it well, you'll, you'll make enough to, to have it as your full-time job and, and that's the, the misconception I feel that there's any sort of luck element involved in self-publishing. There's, there's not, there's not a lottery winner that, you know, all oh, my book's done well just because it's the people doing well worked hard and worked smart to do well and, Anybody listening to this can do the exact same thing if they if they put the right things in place and they, they learn from those who are already doing it. Um, so, yeah, that's the biggest misconception is that self-publishing is not worth it. It is. It's absolutely worth it if you're willing to work hard and work smart. That's probably the biggest key right there is is working hard, working smart, and being prolific. For a writer like myself, I'm, I'm a much slower writer. It just uh, To me, it just... It could be it could be viable, but it would take me such a long, long time to even reap any benefits from it, just because I'm just a, a very slow, you know, writer. I'm more methodical about my approach to writing. You know, some would say like a, a you know a typical traditional publisher like Stephen Graham Jones, uh, who's extremely prolific. Uh, he could probably be just as successful, maybe even more successful, if he would have self published. But yeah. he's, you know, he's finding the success the the regular route. I can only imagine that how how prolific he would have been if he had chosen the self published route. Yeah, definitely. And if you are a prolific writer and you know you are, then you will be held back by traditional contracts that you know have no compete clauses and you know options on them. You know that that do place restrictions on you so I think if you know you've got 100 stories in you and you want them out now then self-publishing is the way to go but I don't think anybody has a right to knock you whatever decision you make it's it's up to you and that's you know a decision for you to own and and no one has a right to pick sides and say you're right you're wrong you know um self-publishing has changed my life I can't say that it'll do that for everybody or that I wouldn't have done better through traditional publishing all I can say right now is that I'm luckier than I ever dreamed I'd be and fortunate and humble and it could all end tomorrow. But right now, you know, I've, 
I've had this wonderful life given to me by a opportunity Amazon gave to me. So, I mean, it's, we've all got to try and do our best in this world. There's failure and success in every avenue of life, and publishing's no different. At least now there's more options, and I think that's that's the the best thing that's happened in the last few years is now it's not this or nothing, it's this or this or this. Right, that's the key to, to getting out there is, is knowing, you know, that there are a lot of avenues to, to get out there, to get your work out to people. Yeah. So what advice would you give to your 18-year-old self? Realise that the world is much bigger than, than you think it is. Um, growing up, you know, I didn't realise you could go outside the town, you know, and I thought the the people around me were the people that would always be around me and realising now how wide the world is um, and connecting with, you know, thousands and thousands of people all over the world who enjoy my books and, and identify with themes that I've written, even though they're living in Australia or um, Germany, you know, it's uh, it's made me feel differently about the world and it's it's made the world a bit of a bright and more enjoyable place to know that life can change so much so quickly. And also, I, I congratulate myself for never giving up on wanting to be a writer. I, I always wanted to do it and I, I made it happen. So as humble as I am, there are times when I have to sort of look at myself and go, you know, well done. I'm glad I never gave up on that dream because I made it happen. If I'd have given up on it, you know, when I became a phone salesman and thought this is my lot in life, it's never going to change, then it never would have. Um, but I get this little spark of hope and, you know, I didn't give up and I gave it a shot. That's, you know, it could have failed, but it didn't. And if you want to do something, then you owe it to yourself to at least give it a shot. Um, and at 18 years old, that's, you know, I'd, I'd say the world's a big place and, you know, don't stop trying for things you want. Well, this is it. And when people look back at their life they talk about the opportunities that they didn't take they don't talk about the opportunities that they took and didn't work out definitely yeah exactly you only live once um, that's right and regret and guilt are the, the worst things to have in your head um mm-hmm. when you do something wrong it stays with you forever you know where success is quickly forgotten so try and minimize the amount of things to feel guilty and regretful over in your life i think that's the key to happiness this has been a very interesting uh, conversation. I could say that, and I think our listeners are really going to enjoy it. You know, it's uh, it's kind of opened my eyes to a, a couple things that I, you know, I, I looked at doing what you were doing, what you're doing now, years ago, and it did seem like at the time that it was probably not something that I, I wanted to to accomplish. And of course, you know, every writer has their own little route. And of course, my, my, my career has taken kind of a, a little bit of a different turn. But it's always been in the back of my mind that if I could be, you know, like I said, prolific, being prolific, writing, actually having more product out there, uh, I would definitely be doing what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, and then that's it. You need to just find the route that works for you. And, you know, if you're not prolific, self-publishing, you know, it's all about algorithms and making Amazon work for you and stuff. And I think being prolific is, is one of the tools at the moment that, that's necessary. Um, I think possible, you know, a route to, to sell, to not be prolific and sell your book is to maybe sell it through your website and, and focus on gathering traffic to that website. Then you're not, you're not relying on Amazon's algorithms. You're relying on your own traffic building. Um, so you might only have one book or two books or a short story. But if you can continually get people to your website to buy that one book, then that's that's a way you can make money from less amount of work. If you're looking at Amazon at the moment, the algorithms do favour um, prolificacy, whatever the, the word is. <laughs> that. Um, but yeah, I think um, if you're looking at Amazon as your main source of income, then yeah, it does it does pay to have books out at least sort of every three four months because of the way Amazon works with recommending your books to people. Um, right. But yeah, you can certainly look at driving your own traffic to a vendor you control, so your own website. Um, I know Pat Flynn of the Smart Passive In. Uh, income website you know makes massive sales on his paperbacks that he sells through his website so you can you can make money from being a less prolific um writer and, and that's either doing the way i've just suggested or going the traditional route right and pat is such an amazing person and i think for anyone 
like looking at starting a business, whether it's writing, whether it's publishing, whatever it is, the smart passive income has to be one of, if not the must listen to podcast. Definitely. Well, he's earning about $150,000 a month from just winning websites at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's <laughs> yeah, great. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I look at things that he's doing when I'm focusing on tweaking my own website. So even authors should be looking at smart passive income because there's a lot of crossover with what Pat talks about that a benefit anybody in any sphere um, mm -hmm. or industry. So um, definitely in regards to affiliate income, because I make, I make money from Amazon affiliate. If I'm recommending my book, I make sure it's an affiliate link because it gives you a few more pence per sale. Um, when I recommend things like pro writing aid on my on my website, I wholeheartedly use the program and love it. But if I'm recommending it, why don't I make some money from it as well? So I make um, seventeen dollars every time somebody buys pro writing aid through the link on my website. So it's things like that that Pat sort of makes you think about. Um, because being an author, it's all about making you know these small streams of income in as many avenues as you can, so that they all come together to make you a living. Mm, absolutely. And where can our listeners connect with you? Um, if they go to my website, which is just ianrobwright.com, um, they can get five of my books for free by joining my newsletter. Or they can search me on Facebook if they want to chat to me directly, which is, again, it's uh, Ian Rob Wright on Facebook. So do you have any final thoughts or a message you'd like to leave our listeners with? Just if you want to be a writer, learn from those who are already doing it. Um, and then based on, on what you learn from them, choose your choose your path and stick to it. Don't let anybody influence you unduly. Learn from those who are sharing information freely because those are usually the people you can trust. Yeah, that's great advice. And thank you so much for spending so much of your time with us this morning. I really think, as Bob said, it's going to have given our listeners an awful lot to think about. I hope so. It's been a pleasure. I mean, maybe we're, no, na definitely. we're now going to have, you know, a surge of people who listen to this, who are writers, who are now going to go out and start self-publishing. That's my sincere hope. Thank you for listening to our podcast with Ian Rob Wright. If you would like to win Ian's entire back catalogue, in ebook form, then we have a competition for you. Simply email michael at thisishorror.co.uk subject line Ian Rob Wright competition. There's a question that I didn't get to ask Ian, so I sent him a message, and that was simply what he does to stay motivated and to stay productive. And Ian kindly replied and said, To stay motivated, I keep set hours and work in an office. I have to make my writing feel like a job and not a hobby. Furthermore, using tools such as Scrivener helps me stay organised and efficient. So, with that said, it is time to wrap up the podcast. If you'd like to support us on Patreon and I'd love it if you could. I mean, it's great in terms of keeping the podcast alive, allowing us to develop it and to get new equipment for the podcast. Then just head on over to Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. There are a number of bonuses when you become a patron, including early bird access to our podcast, discounts off ebooks. Finding out about all our announcements uh, before anyone else, including the most recent announcement, the acquisition of a new novella from Josh Malaman, the author of Bird Box, which I'm so excited about. So, another way you can support us is to rate us and leave a review on iTunes. So, with all that said... Take care of yourselves, look after one another, and as always, have a great day.